This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Uh, I'm Roger Jelinek, your host on Bookwell's Think Tech Hawaii. And my guest today is Kealoha Fox, of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, where she seems to run just about everything. <laughs> Um, and she's the author of uh, a new book called uh, Mana Lahui uh, Kanaka. And uh, uh, we'll uh, talk about that today. Um, Kealoha, tell us about yourself first. Uh, where, where are you from and uh, your, some of your history? Oh, okay. So uh, are you, you're not from Oahu? Or um, you, I think? Or so I, I am from Kunia. Mm -hmm. uh, my ancestral homelands for my family is from the island of Maui and then Kohala on Hawaii Island. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And when did you, how did you find your way to Oahu? Um, <coughs> largely for school, uh -huh. uh, yeah, to be totally honest. Um, when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I went to the Hawaii Pacific University just right down uh -huh. the road um, where I studied psychology and anthropology and history. Um, and then my most recent time at school was at the Johnny Byrne School of Medicine here in Kakako. Ah, and, and uh, what, what have been your academic background, your interests? Um, so my PhD is actually in biomedical science. Uh -huh. uh, my specialization is in clinical research. Um, my real passion is really Native Hawaiian health and uh, medicine. Um, but then I also have um, a master's degree in clinical psychology too, um, to help serve um, Native Hawaiians and other um, ethnic minorities in their behavioral health needs. And, and what, what was the focus of your, your clinical research? Um, so uh, <clears throat> my work is actually largely looking at Hawaiian conceptualizations of illness and disease, so um, what we call ma'i, um, so it can mean a different type of um, physical imbalance or an emotional entanglement or it can also be um, a spiritual sickness as well. And you do that, uh, you also work on particularly on health issues at OHA? I do, you know? yeah. So um, I'm a part of a fabulous team um, at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, where we cover issues of not just um, health but education, housing, um, governance, AINA, so land and water, uh, resources and rights, a, a whole spectrum of issues that impact Native Hawaiians. And when, when you're not writing this book, which of those do you actually do, or do you do them all? Uh, probably pre primarily health. Um, yeah, that's uh -huh. really my passion, and then that's my academic training and um, background as well. Okay. Okay, let's, let's get into this book, okay. which is a big project. Yes. Um, Give me the, the history of it. No. Um, so um, I'm, I'm one of several writers and editors, and so this was really a team approach. Um, so we're all um, Kanaka Oivi, we're all Native Hawaiians that came together um, as part of a, a, a research endeavor that started in um, about 2009, 2010, um, led by my boss and the pohana of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Dr. Kamana Opono Crab. Um, and so he set this framework for us to look at um, resilience and strength and um, cultural identity to help uplift and to ho'ulu um, our lahui, so, so to grow a beloved nation. Just elaborate a little bit on the resi resilience mm -hmm. uh, theme, what, what that actually means. So um, especially in the social sciences and health and education, conventional metrics, measures, usually talk about inequities. A lot of times we're talking about disparities or where the gaps are. Um, us as indigenous scholars, um, as, as uh, Native Hawaiians, we're actually trying to look at a different lens. We want to look at what are our positive strengths, our attributes, um, and really looking at it from what's a, a cultural foundation that we can help to build and uplift from rather than uh, data and measures that um, can tend to bring us and weigh us down. Okay, and, and central to this concept of resilience is this idea of mana, mm -hmm. which has a, 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 a very long, long history in Hawaiian culture. Mm -hmm. um, let's start there. What, what's, what's the history of mana? Um, and so, it's, And it's, it exists throughout the 
it's not just in Hawaiian culture. Right, right throughout Polynesia. Polynesia yeah. Right. And so we do talk about yeah. that um, within the book, um, especially uh, in the first chapter, but then also with the focus groups and talking to leaders in mm -hmm. the community. So we're not just looking um, only through a Hawaiian lens. We do actually open up um, the conversation and the discussion to include ways of knowing throughout Polynesia, throughout Oceania. Um, uh, many of our traditions are so closely connected um, and they have lots of points of comparison. And so we do bring that out within the research and, and the writing itself. When, when you use a term like ways of knowing, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? Um, so for us, it's multifaceted. It's multi-layered, right? So um, one of the first areas that you'll see in the book is, is a part of our ways of knowing is within our, our mo'olelo, within our own stories, with our own legends, um, within our own proverbial sayings that have been passed down orally from generation to generation. Um, we also looked at the, the Hawaiian language newspapers as a corpus and looked at where mana is discussed um, specifically within those texts. Um, but then we're also looking at ways of knowing through other Hawaiian scholars and authors, right? So um, Dr. Osorio and Lily Kala and, um, and, and many intellectual leaders that we have within our community today. And, and uh, where do you find mana? Um, well, I think uh, what you'll understand. There are many categories yes. of mana. Right? So <laughs> let's, let's just let's run through the principal categories of mana because they're, you know, they're described in some detail. In the yes. Book, yeah. So we touch on some pretty big themes, right, yeah. that came yeah. through the research. Yeah. Um, it's it's mana is within leadership, right? It's it's within power of those of us that exalt that that role and that position within our community. Is it what we think of in the West as charisma? Um, I think it's it's probably more layered than that, uh -huh. um, and I think there's real um, there's great stories from our ali'i from our chiefs, um, and our chief says that actually um, explicit, explicitly kind of display mana uh -huh. right within ceremony, um, within um, rules and regulations that we've set forth, um, and the way in which they they managed cultural and natural resources for generations upon generations. All of that to us is mana. And, and, and mana is inherited or is it acquired or both? Yeah, so by the, by the time you read the full book, you um, hopefully learn that it, it's actually both. So it is inherited, um, so it's part of our geneal genealogy of who we are. Um, but it's also acquired through um, acts of service, through education, through training, um, through mentoring. And that's part of the different, um, you know, uh, touch points that we try to land on throughout the book. And how, how is it recognized? Um, so we, we start mm -hmm. first with um, ways of recognition through maybe a, a teacher, um, so uh, an elder. Um, so through some expert within that field or discipline, right? So just as I have trained in my field or the other authors have trained in their fields, um, so too have we in our traditional cultural practices as well. And so we bring those examples forth too, whether it's fishing or farming or carving or lomi lomi, all of these have these expert positions um, and, and unique qualities and traits that they bring forth as, as mana that is passed on from generation to generation. And are there, are there degrees of mana? Um, yeah, so I think what we try yeah. to explain is that um, it's, a, it's a spectrum, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. It can be positive, it can be negative, but it can also be maintained and it can be balanced, right? So for preservation. And so there's kind of always this ebb and flow of, of gaining and acquiring over time, but also um, maybe when we're acting negatively or we're not doing the right protocols and procedures that actually um, cause us to lose our mana. So when, uh, to, just to take that a bit further, the, the negative mana, negative mana, mm -hmm. how, uh, how is that experienced? Or is that uh, like your subject of malevolence or is it a... Right, no? right, absolutely. <clears throat> so um, uh, it could be the way in which you treat, um, say, the land or the mm -hmm. environment around you. That degradation, right, is then your act to the aina, to the land, um, is then actually brought back to you as the person that actually caused that disruption, right? So that would be an example of, of perhaps the negative 
Um, and is is um, is mana something that's observed and measured? Or is it is it something that's only felt by those who feel it, uh, or is it recognized in some public way? Or I think it, it's actually <laughs> all of those things. Yeah. So there's definitely examples of mana that's publicly recognized, right? So you have um, different hoike or uniki ceremonies, right? These, mm -hmm. these graduations or these promotions where mana in, in itself is displayed, that you've reached this level, you've acquired this set of skills, and we are now naming you as a master level of this. Um, but it's also so intrinsic and it can be so personal um, to individuals within a certain community or within a certain family of the way that they experience and they feel that together might be also um, hard to put into words or it might be hard to describe. Um, but there's a feeling there and they know that's mana. And is, is part of the mission of the book to not, not only to define it but also uh, to generate it? Yes. yes. And how, yes. I mean, how do you see that working? Right. So we, um, we actually start the book with a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, not only what is mana, but we, we really tried to um, explore this idea of then how do we cultivate it, right? Especially for the positive. Where are those areas that we can um, start to support and elevate over time that will make mana continue to increase, right? Where we can build capacity and give um, credence to those leaders that are doing that within um, our communities all, all around the Paiaina. Give, give, give me some examples of, of uh, how you try and cultivate mana. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we really uh, tried to look at and explore is there's some really great community-based organizations, some really great nonprofits. Um, that they're directly in the community. They're providing direct service to children, youth, adolescents, to our elders and our kupuna, the whole spectrum, right? And um, what they're doing is, is really leading that movement. And we're trying to help articulate this concept and this dynamic kind of um, idea around all of what does that mean collectively if you, if you add it all together, what is this continued elevation and promotion mean to us through Hawaiian lens using Hawaiian terms. And uh, so how, how did you set about this, this great project with defining, defining mana and, and uh, mm. cultivating it? Um, well, mm. I, I think I have to um, totally give respect and honor to our, mm -hmm. our CEO, our, our Pohana at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Dr. Kamana Opono Krab. Um, this was really his vision um, for several years. He, um, he describes in the book um, examples of mana within his own life, within his family, um, uh, mentoring with his uncle, with expert leaders in the community like Dr. K. Kuni Blaisdell um, that helped him to cultivate his mana as a contemporary Native Hawaiian leader right now. Um, and so that kind of comes forth from, from a personal perspective mm -hmm of um, almost in reflection, I would say, but it's also a part of the training that we've received um, to look at those opportunities and examples within every single one of our own lives as, as strengths, as mana, uh -huh. that we're, we're experiencing in real time too. Out, outside of the book, uh, at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, where you, where you do this work, uh, is, is mana something that is cultivated very deliberately as a, as a value? Yes, you know? I, would, I would say um, we've, we've tried to really strive and make efforts so that our staff, um, the leadership within the organization, um, understands that this is a role and responsibility for them as well. Um, how we serve Native Hawaiians at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is a part of our mission. And so we take that really seriously and, and we wanna know what's the best way that we can do that to meet the community needs um, all, kind of along the way. And so we're absolutely helping to build that from within first before we even start to look outside of our own organization. Okay, great. Well, we'll come take a small break and we'll okay. come back to that. Okay. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness.
Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii Fridays at 3 p.m. Hawaiian Standard Time. We explore environmental issues, political issues, keeping it local any way we can. Aloha. Uh, here I am back with uh, Kealoha Box discussing the, uh, this a new book that comes out of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, called Mana uh, uh, Lahui Kanaka. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it has a longer subtitle. Tell us about the longer subtitle because it's part of the ambition of the book. Uh, yeah, uh, so um, one thing that you'll see throughout the book is there's all different levels of meaning and there's different ways of knowing that we've tried to articulate. So from the very beginning, when you look at the, the cover art, right? So um, a great uh, Native Hawaiian artist, Solomon Enos, actually, yes. he created this originally for us. Um, so it starts just right there. And then um, the the dedication of the book, the Ola Lono Eau, and then you start to see um, several different renderings of mana from an artistic, um, creative point of view. Are, are part of the chapter sections. Uh -huh. And so we didn't just want it to be one way of knowing, right? So just uh, narrative based. We actually wanted the book in and of itself uh -huh. to physically represent mana too. And, and that the book as a tangible object has mana uh -huh. and it has this essence that we hope comes across every time you turn the page, yes. All right, I, I can attest to that. <laughs> no. Um, so it was a big project and involved a lot of people. A lot of people. Um, uh, um, were you one of the principal leaders of it? I think you, you were, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us a bit, a bit about how that was put together. Yeah, um, thanks. Yeah. So yeah. Um, in, in just as much as the book is a tangible representation mm -hmm. of Mana Tu, um, I think the last count I have is about 157 um, individuals worked on this, and we worked with other organizations um, to partner as well, um, including the artists, right? Including the participants that you'll you'll read their voices right. within the focus groups, um, the other research that we bring forth, and the the authors that we cite. All of that to us. Um, is, is collective, right? It's a collaboration. We really feel like when we come together and we look at these issues or we look at these potential possibilities together, it's much stronger than any one of us trying to do this work alone. So we feel like that 157, those, those voices, the energy, the work that was put forward, we hope that that's represented here too. Of it, we're hoping to build a movement of, of who, you know, who comes together uh, within the community for the next, not just this generation or the next hundred years, but the, the movement being with with what mission? No. I'm, I th I think to really grow no. um, positive health and and well being um, so for it's who part we of are the as resilience mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, it goes back to what we were yeah. talking about before. I I was especially fascinated by the there's a an essay planted. Mm. In, in there on the newspaper project, new paper, uh, and the evolution of the concept of mana in the newspapers. Can right. you describe some of that? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, one of the other authors, um, Holly Kilinohai Coleman, um, she really took the lead of helping us to textually analyze the Hawaiian language newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, so through um, the Papakilo database and our um, ongoing partnership, um, with Puake and Ogumaya um, in Kauisai Durua, we've actually helped to digitize and store Hawaiian language newspapers on. Of which there were about 100, right? Um, well, so we have about, I think, 125,000 uh, pages uh, within the corpus. I right. mean, um, so what um, Kilinahe did within our team is really help us to systematically and methodically analyze mana using the text within the within the newspapers. And so what you'll see is a case study um, using Mo'olelo where we've kind of really gone through that example. And we don't just show the content of what comes out of the story, but we're also trying to show the process, right? So this, we hope, helps to inspire other Hawaiian students 
or learners that they can apply these methods and these processes within their own research, within their own programs. W would you say that the concept has evolved over, over time of the concept of mana, or that it's actually a constant that's rediscovered in different ways? Mm. I think um, mm. I think part of what you'll see is as much as we look to the past, to the Kavamam one, and mm -hmm. what we're talking about maybe within the contemporary lens, is that um, I kind of look at it like a, a cylinder, where sometimes we might be going um, into a more narrow part of the spiral, and sometimes we might be going to the broader kind of mouth. But at some point, we're actually touching on the same spot, that same marker, that same landing point, uh -huh. right? Um, within the same within the same concept that kind of feels and, and looks the same. Uh, and and uh, uh, how how are you going to broadcast this mission to the Hawaiian community? Um, so one of um, yeah. one of the things that we talked about as a team and we had a great set of um, advisory board members that helped to um, you know, really guide us along the way is, um, so the book is free to view and download anytime, anywhere. Um, and that's on our website. And so we're hoping um, those community-based programs, um, students within university, um, teachers and professors within schools, we hope people um, access it and that they start to utilize it in their own, you know, projects or programs or their own groups and have these discussions and really talk about it, right? Well, as you, as you know, um, I, I run the Hawaii Book and Music Festival mm -hmm. and we certainly plan to feature, feature it there with, with uh, at least one panel. Yeah, and, we're and, uh, excited. Um, where, where do you see it um, hitting home most successfully? Well, what, what, uh, where do you see the reactions from the community coming from? I, I, I'm, I think I'm most excited about that. So we mm -hmm. do want to go across Hawaii into communities and um, have these discussions with participants from the project, um, you know, host community meetings where we can start to have these conversations um, in maybe a more intimate and, and um, detailed setting mm -hmm. where we can start to really massage like, what does this mean maybe in Hilo or in Hana or in Waimea and Kauai, right? It might look and feel very different from uh -huh. one community to the other. So I think we're really excited for that next step in 2018. Have you found that kind of uh, geographic distribution of perception in the, re in the research that went into the book? Mm -hmm. So what you'll see is I think the, th the major themes themselves, right? So leadership, uh, the environment, um, families, communities, those are constant themes that you'll yeah. see kind of anywhere. But um, certain behaviors and traits and qualities of mana are absolutely um, differing from one island to the next. Oh, give me an example. Um, so we have, we, and I think we tried to um, be uh, pretty diverse in the distribution. Mm -hmm. So even with the focus group participants, um, we have participants from all across different communities, and so they bring different ways of knowing, right? So, um, for example, uh, some of the traditional Hawaiian medicine practitioners, um, certain plants are not found in every area, wow. right? It's the same for our hula halau and yeah. practitioners. Um, the adornment that they wear for their protocols and ceremonies aren't uh, necessarily across. found, yeah, yeah in, in yeah. certain areas than others. And so um, that's a different representation of mana right uh -huh. there in and of itself. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, did hula take a, a, a major part in the discussion of mana? It uh, did, yes. Yeah. I think um, especially because um, we've seen such revitalization and resurgence of hula uh -huh. over the past few decades um, that uh, hula as a, as a practice is, is quite well known to a broad audience from all around the world. Um, but it still has a very sacred and spiritual foundation and meaning to why do we chant these chants and why do we dance these dances and who are we honoring when we speak of these place names or when we are adorn ourselves with those flowers. I think that's all a part of um, what, what you'll see in some of the examples. And, and, and there are some really great tangible stories um, that I think people will will definitely latch on to. 
And do you think people will, will return to the same sensibility that Hula started with? In other words, uh, I can understand when, when uh, uh, a halal chants a certain uh, melee that's very traditional, uh, and I can imagine what it was like when that melee was mm. originated. Mm -hmm. But we live in a very different time now. So uh, there's a certain archival museum quality to what they're, to what mm. they're doing. But uh, I imagine part of your hope is to make the, make the mana alive today uh, in, in a way, not just analogous, but at least as powerfully as it was originally. Yeah, yeah so, um, <clears throat> and I think that's what will come out more in the panel at the uh -huh. festival is so um, Dr. Lisa Watkins Victorino and Mehana Okala Hind are both Kumuha, um, who've actually graduated from um, two different halal. And um, at their expert level, I think um, that's probably where I would defer to them. But uh -huh. I do think that's a part of the conversations and the themes that we had back within our team is um, as we revitalize and reestablish these practices, um, what are some of those, those um, intentional ways and purposeful ways that we also want to do that um, for, the, for the community, you know, kind of at large too? Well, I, I, I certainly hope that the, the Hawaii Book and Music Festival that will have a tiny role <laughs> in this resurgence. And uh, thank you very much. Oh, mahalo uh, to you. Yeah.